Well, that's one Peter. Now I'm going to move on to two Peter, the second letter he wrote. And we're back to a, a little diagram, but one that's very much easier to understand. <laughs> Sorry I gave you such complicated ones in Hebrews and earlier, but here's one I'm sure you can all understand perfectly plainly. But the second letter of Peter, don't try and copy it all right down straight away because I'm not going to refer to this for a few moments. The second letter of Peter deals with a totally different situation. Same people, but a few years later. It's different in style, and those differences could well be that he's using a different secretary, a different amanuensis. And indeed he says he was using Silvanus, Paul's secretary, who probably knocked it into shape. But the similarities are all there. Peter's favourite words still appear in the second letter as well. Some scholars say the second letter is not by him. I believe it is by him. Do you know Peter's favourite word? All preachers have favourite words. All you have, Chris. I've noticed them already. <laughs> you must have noticed mine. Do you know what Peter's favourite word is? I think it's one of his favourite words as well. Precious. Right? You've used that word. And that was one of Peter's favourite words. And if you go through the two letters, you'll find he keeps talking about our precious faith, our precious Jesus. Everything's precious to Peter. He's found the pearl of great price. And he loves using that word, precious, precious. It's, it's the word you use of something or someone that's so valuable to you. My most precious possession. See? Precious. So that convinces me it's Peter, but I'm prepared to think he's using a different secretary. That would account for the different of style quite comfortably. But the content of the letter is totally different, and the reason for that is that he's now talking about dangers inside the church. There are two kinds of pressure we face, the pressures from outside the church and the pressures from inside. And it's the ones from the inside that are the more dangerous. I told you earlier that Satan has never destroyed the church from outside. The more he hits it from the outside, the bigger and stronger it gets. And that's why during the first three centuries of Christianity, when Christians were being thrown to the lions regularly, the church never grew so fast. That's why behind the Iron Curtain formerly, behind the Bamboo Curtain today, you can go to China and find villages where 85% of the population are born again. Now the church has stopped growing behind the Iron Curtain. Since the Iron Curtain came down, it's tragic. It was with pastors in East Germany they said it was far easier to build a church before the Iron Curtain came down. Now all our folk are going materialistic like the West and church attendance is declining. So, were you glad when the Iron Curtain came down? It's a mixed blessing. And in fact, the church is not what it was now in Eastern Europe. But at least the door's open for us to go in there and help if we can. But in China, still the bamboo curtain and the church is growing and growing and growing. But Satan can destroy it from the inside and I'm afraid hostility is one thing, that's a simple pressure. But heresy is a subtle pressure. And 2 Peter is about this bigger danger. Now, there is one question that arises. When you read 2 Peter, especially chapter 2, you will find that it's almost word for word the letter of Jude. Have you, some of you have noticed that. Now, there are five possible explanations. When you find two writers in the Old and New Testament saying the same words, there are five different explanations. It's not a problem. It's, the problem is which of the answers to choose. For example, Micah and Isaiah. Have you ever noticed that there's one section in Isaiah 2 and Micah 4, or is it the other way around? Behold, in the latter days the mountain of the Lord, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Word for word. And both Isaiah and Micah said. Now, when you come across that phenomenon in Scripture, there are five possibilities. Here they are. Number one, Peter borrowed it from Jude. Number two, Jude borrowed it from Peter. Number three, Peter and Jude borrowed it from somewhere else. Number four, Peter and Jude got together and discussed the problem and agreed on the solution. <laughs> and sent it in different letters. Number five, the Holy Spirit gave them exactly the same words, both of them. Well, take your pick. 
I'm inclined not to believe the last one because the Holy Spirit doesn't use people as word processors. We mustn't think that inspiration of Scripture means that people were just typewriters on which the Holy Spirit typed. And so it's unlikely that the Holy Spirit would give exactly the same words to two different people. I think it does mean that Peter and Jude did know each other. Whether one got it from the other or the other got it from the one or they both got it from somewhere else, I think there is evidence of some collaboration. But then Peter was one of the inner circle of disciples and Jude was another of the Lord's own brothers. And it is highly likely that they knew each other. But anyway, their, their material in the second chapter, and of course Jude is very short, it's the same length as Peter's second chapter. Well, it's the same problem was hitting both their churches and I can summarise it in four things. If you've heard my tapes on Jude, Jude, you know what's coming. Jude is a most neglected little letter. We haven't time to go through it. But there were four corruptions happening, four symptoms of a disease right inside the church, a cancer in the body of Christ. And here they are. Number one, a corrupt creed. A corrupt creed. The beliefs were being changed. And two in particular, a sentimental view of the grace of God and a syncretistic view of the person of Christ. Now, forgive the complication there. Turn it the other way around. A synchristic view of the person of Christ. They were saying, he is not the only Lord, he's just one among others. Compar comparative religion. He is a way, but there are many other ways to God. He is not the only way. That's that, that word only which is the offence, you know. So they were corrupting the person of Christ and saying he's a way, not the way. And then they had a sentimental view of the love of God, the grace of God, which says, God loves to forgive you, so it doesn't matter if you sin. Now you can imagine what that would do. A corrupt creed means, secondly, a corrupt conduct. What you believe affects your behaviour. And invariably, when you change Christian faith, you introduced immorality into the church. And I'm afraid immorality was getting into the churches that Peter and Jude were writing to. See, if it doesn't really matter how you live, now that you've got your ticket to heaven and that God loves to forgive you, so he'll go on forgiving you no matter what you do. That is sheer sentiment. It's being preached widely. But of course it means that Christians go on sinning, take advantage of God's mercy, and it leads to immorality. But when conduct has been corrupted, the next thing that is corrupted is character. And there's a description of the effects of all this on the character of people and they become more animal than human, operate by base instincts. They become greedy and lustful and their character changes. They are no longer reliable. They're like clouds driven by the wind, waves of the sea. All these descriptions are there. It's vivid of weak character. And the fourth thing that gets corrupted is conversation. The church gets filled with grumblers and complainers and people rebelling against leadership and all the kind of unrest that you can get in a fellowship. Now both 2 Peter and Jude go through this, the corrupt creed, a change of belief, a corrupt conduct that follows from it, immorality, a corrupt character that weakens people's character and personality and a corrupt conversation that issues from that weak character so that you get a general unrest and a grumbling and a complaining and talking against leadership. Now all that's devastating and I'm sure as I go through it you recognise that this is happening in many churches. And both 2 Peter and Jude fought this thing hard. They saw that it would finish off the church and it wouldn't need suffering from outside the thing would have collapsed from within and a church like that under persecution will not stand. Now 2 Peter follows exactly the same kind of pattern as 1 Peter which convinces me again. It's in, from the same author. There is a section on salvation, then a section on the danger and then a drawing out of the implications and how to be ready to cope. 
And this diagram sums up the first part of 2 Peter, the section on our salvation. It's a lovely, uh, simple picture. Um, here is the household of faith, built on the foundation of faith. There are some steps of faith up to the front door, which are not in 2 Peter, but are in Peter's sermon in Acts, so I've just put them in. First step, repent. Second step, be baptised. Third step, receive the Holy Spirit. No more steps up to the front door than that. And all three are steps of faith. Again, get my book, The Normal Christian Birth, for spelling that out. So now we have entered the household of God, the household based on faith, by taking these steps. But now there's a staircase inside. And he says, to your faith add virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to your knowledge self-control, to your self-control patience, to your patience godliness, to your godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. And in climbing that staircase you are building up your hope. He's talking about a grand entrance into glory about making your calling and election sure. If you want to make your calling and election sure, you can't do it at the bottom of the staircase. You do it by climbing up those stairs. That's how you make it sure. By reaching the upper room of love, which is where the church should be living. But he emphasised that you're building up your hope for the future as you climb these stairs and your certainty about what God is going to do will get stronger and stronger as you climb the stairs. So the church is founded on faith, grows in hope as it climbs these stairs, and the climax is living in love. And there's a balcony upstairs, and from that balcony you take off for glory. <laughs> All right? And you make a grand entrance, a rich welcome will be given you in heaven. So it's really saying progress. Don't sit down in the sofa on the ground floor. <coughs> Climb the stairs. Live in the upper room. Get up there as quickly as you can. In other words, the answer to heresy is maturity. People down here are vulnerable to false teaching on the ground floor. The higher you go, the more you're living up here, then the less you are vulnerable to heresy and false teaching. But if you listen to false teaching, you'll find yourself going out a back door and slipping down a slippery slope and falling. And he says some pretty severe things about this. He says, it would be better for you never to have known the way of righteousness. Better for you never to have entered than to fall. And he has some pretty crude remarks about a dog going back to lick its own vomit. Have you seen a dog do that? He said, that's what you're doing. You came from sin, you're going back to it. You're like a dog going and licking up its sick. Or you're like a pig that's going back to wallow in the mud after you've bathed it and washed it. <coughs> Vivid. But take those words seriously. It's better never to have known than to fall away. To fall from grace would be better if you'd never heard about grace. Better for someone who's never heard than someone who has and goes back to their own sick and their own mud. And that happens through false teaching, which erodes the foundation of faith. So uh, alas, there are some people who come in the right way and go straight across and out the back door and slip or at some later stage do that. And there are those who climb the stairs, get stronger in hope, and reach the room of love, and take off for glory. These go back under the wrath and judgment of God. These enjoy the sunshine of His grace and favour. That's quite a message, isn't it? Then the final chapter in 2 Peter takes this whole notion of hope for the future, one of the pressures inside the church that they were having were people who say, all this talk about the second coming and all this talk about, you know, Jesus coming back. Well, where is he? 
And already in the first century, people were saying, well, where is he? And if they said it then, how much more people can throw it at us today? 2,000 years and he's still not back. See, And scoffing is a very difficult thing to handle when people make fun of your faith, isn't it? And Peter in the third chapter of his second letter says, these scoffers, they say, where is the promise of his coming? All things are just as they were at the beginning, nothing's changed. And I'm afraid people say to us, Christianity's been in the world 2,000 years and look at it. Nothing's any better, nothing's changed. Ah, but we still have hope. And our hope is this, that one day all this universe is to be dissolved in fire. There's to be another holocaust. And it's not this time to be a flood of water, but a flood of fire. I just imagine, not that it would be a nuclear war, but that God would just release all the energy in every atom. He packed the energy into the atom, all he'd need to do would be to unlock it. The whole thing goes up in smoke. And then it says, but out of the fire, like a, a phoenix rising from the flames, there's a new heaven and a new earth. I love preaching about the new earth. Don't leave it to the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's our truth, it's in the Bible. But I'm afraid Christians only want to hear about going to heaven. There's a new earth coming. We shall see that when we look at Revelation. This earth is going to be the centre of the future. A new earth a new planet on which we live. We're the only ones who know this. Everybody's panicking about the ozone layer and the polluted oceans and the dying forests. They're panicking because they think this is the only planet we'll ever have to live on. We know better than that. We look for a new heavens and a new earth. But there is going to be something about the new heaven and the new earth which will be so different from this planet we have known. And the difference will be this. It will be a new heaven and earth in which righteousness dwells. There will be no vice, no crime, no sin, nothing dirty, nothing filthy, <coughs> nothing. Now, if you really believe that, Peter says, you won't listen to all these scoffers, you know it's coming, but what manner of people, what manner of people ought we to be if we know all this, that all this world is going and a new world is coming in which no sin will ever be allowed? Well, the answer is simple you live holy and godly lives, you get ready, start packing. And so his real defence is against all the immorality that can get into the church through false teaching. You keep your eyes fixed on that new world, a world of righteousness, and that'll hold you to your righteousness. Keep your living right, because you know that if you don't, you won't be part of that new world. So live up here in faith, hope and love and get ready for glory. When you hear the sound of the trumpet, you'll have your first free flight to the Holy Land. <laughs> what a meeting! That's the word on my grandfather's tombstone in Newcastle. Three words from an old Methodist hymn. There is his name, David Ledger Pawson, and underneath, what a meeting! If you don't like noisy worship, don't be around. The archangel will be shouting, the trumpet's blowing, it'll be enough to raise the dead. <laughs> That's exactly what it'll do. And those who've died will get front seats, so don't worry if you die first. You'll get a front seat then because you rise first and we shall all meet him in the end. Beyond that, a new heaven and a new earth. Peter says, keep your hope fixed on that and you will live the way that you will need to live to be part of that new world. You won't listen to this rubbish. You won't get caught up in it and tainted by it. You'll keep yourself unspotted even from the apostate church. Never mind the world and you'll go for it. Well, thank you, Peter, for those two letters. They're going to hold us. At the moment, there's more pressure inside the church for heresy than outside in this country, so two Peter is more relevant at the moment. But there will come a day fairly soon when one Peter will be the letter that will hold us to faith, hope and love. Amen. Amen. Amen.